By its very nature, sporting competition tests the human body to the limit. Our bodies have to perform an amazing variety of functions, like turning, twisting, thrusting, and absorbing impacts. In particular, elite athletes often dazzle us with astonishing feats of physical skill, dexterity, and endurance. And we're only seeing the outside layer of the human body. Underneath the skin, there are bones, muscles, tendons, ligaments, organs, and all the other elements of our internal structure. These elements somehow manage to combine their functions at the right time and in the right way to produce, for example, the contortions required for a pole vault. On the inside, there really isn't that much difference between elite athletes and the rest of us. So don't think that your own sporting efforts aren't also impressive. Whether it's you or David Beckham kicking a goal, the same sorts of anatomical functions are involved. So how does it all happen? In this program, we're going to examine how our anatomy allows us to be physically active. To assist our understanding, we'll split the topic into four body systems. The skeletal system, the muscular system, the respiratory system, and the circulatory system. To meet the demands of sport, a very strong basic structure is needed. But this structure must also be capable of a vast range of movements. This combination is provided by the skeleton. The skeleton has five main functions in the human body. It provides a rigid framework for body shape and support for soft tissues. Without the skeleton, the body would collapse under the influence of gravity. Bones surround and protect the internal organs. For example, the ribs form the chest cavity to protect the heart and lungs. The bones help produce movement by providing attachment for tendons and muscles. For example, the heel bone provides attachment for the Achilles tendon. Bones store and release minerals like calcium and phosphorus. Excess minerals from our food are stored in the bones and then released when needed. Finally, bones produce blood cells. The spongy red bone marrow inside the bones of the human body produces millions of blood cells every second. A newborn baby has 305 bones, but as we age, many of these bones fuse in order to obtain maximum strength. By age 25, the average adult skeleton has 206 bones. These bones are harder and stronger than a young child's, especially amongst people who exercise regularly. The skeleton can be divided into two main parts, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton refers to the bones that are grouped along an imaginary line that runs down the body's axis. These are the skull, sternum, rib cage, and vertebral column. The vertebral column is made up of 33 individual vertebrae which are separated by discs of cartilage. The flexibility this provides is very important for athletes. The appendicular skeleton refers to the appendages that are attached to the axial skeleton. These are the shoulder girdle which is connected to our arms and the pelvic girdle which is connected to our legs. The long bones of the arms the humerus, radius and ulna, and the legs, the femur, tibia and fibula, act as levers to produce a wide range of rapid, large and powerful movements. At the extremities of the limbs are the short bones of the hands and feet. Of the 60 bones that make up the arms, 54 are in the hands. The small size of these bones means the hand is extremely flexible which allows finer sporting movements to be performed. 
Short bones also help the hands and feet to absorb heavy impacts. The skeleton has three major types of joint. Fibrous, immovable joints such as between the sacrum and the pelvic girdle. Cartilaginous, partially movable joints such as between the ribs and the sternum and synovial, freely movable joints found throughout the body. There are six types of synovial joint. Saddle, hinge, pivot, ovoid, ball and socket and gliding. All are obviously important for athletes but the ball and socket joint and the hinge joint are particularly crucial. The arms and legs are attached to the shoulder and pelvic girdles by ball and socket joints. In the shoulder joint, the ball of the humerus joins with a socket formed by the scapula. In the hip joint, a ball at the head of the femur fits into a socket in the pelvis. In both joints, the ball is surrounded by a strong, flexible sheath of ligament which holds the bones securely in place. Ball and socket joints allow for a wide range of movements, including forward, back, side and rotation. These movements have many applications in sport. Hinge joints are completely different. They occur at the elbows and knees and allow movement in one plane only, not side to side. In the elbow, the trochlea of the humerus joins with the ulna. This provides a pivot point for the leverage systems of the limb and allows the application of maximum force in one specific direction.